I have the honor here uh, to introduce Susan Atty. Uh, Susan is, econ uh, is the economics and technology professor at Stanford Graduate School of Business. She's a member of the National Academy of Science and American Academy of Arts and Sciences, fellow of the Econ Econometric Society, International Association of Applied Economics and Game Theory Society, Society for Advancement of Economic Theory, and corresponding fellow of the British Academy. She's the recipient of the John Bates Clark Medal, awarded to people under 40, uh, making great contributions to knowledge. Uh, she served as president and before that vice president uh, of the American Economic Association, uh, chief economist of the US Department of Justice Antitrust Division, chief economist for Microsoft for like six years, long-term advisor of the British Columbia Ministry of Forest, helping them improve, architect and implement the auction-based pricing system. She was founding associate director of Stanford Institute of Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence and founding director of Golub Capital uh, Social Impact Lab at Stanford. And I did say in the beginning that she is at Stanford GSB, which I'm willing to repeat now. Uh, her research focuses on economics and digitization, marketplace design, and intersection of econometrics and machine learning, which makes her perfect for this conference. Her academic career started at the study of auction uh, and the development of theoretical results to replace strong functional form assumptions in models uh, with more plausible conditions such as monotonicity leading to more robust empirical results. She worked several applications including areas including timber auction, internet search, online advertising, news media, virtual currencies and the use of digital technology and social impact application. Since the late 2000s, she has been working in the intersection of statistics, economics, and machine learning. Her work inspired and propelled a new generation of tech economists studying market design, machine learning, and impact of technology and economy. Her many contributions included developing and deploying machine learning methods for causal inference. For something more personal, I first met Susan when she was at Microsoft, and at the time she was still talking about auction and auction design, which was really fascinating and very interesting. And more recently, I heard her explain the difference between econometrics and machine learning and how the two fields should learn from each other, which makes her literally perfect for this conference. Uh, today, she's going to talk about machine learning and modeling worker careers. And please welcome Susan. Well, thanks so much for having me here. This is just an amazing conference, and I'm so delighted to see, although it's a little bit almost dislocating to have all of these different communities that I've interacted with over the time all in the same place, but very fun. Um, so the work I'm going to talk about today is a little different than other stuff I've been doing recently um, in that I'm really digging in deeper to the, the deep learning world and the world of foundation models. Um, and you know, I was talking to some folks at, at a break and talking about like how I think about ideas and why I do what I do. And, and one thing I found is that if I want to get insight about something, I need to really just use it and understand it. And so one of my big picture motivations for all of this was that, of course, these large language models are very important. They're very hard to understand. And so I'm working in an environment that I can't understand. And, and it's a little bit of a laboratory for developing insights. Um, and so hopefully you'll learn something from my journey as well. We've got a very interdisciplinary team here. Um, Kian Bafa, who actually um, presented one paper that I'm also going to touch on today, um, although I hope our presentations are complements and not substitutes. Um, he's a CS background and is a postdoc at Harvard. Um, Tian Yudu is the, the lead on another one of the projects I'll talk about today, and he's at the Institute for Computational and Mathematical Engineering at Stanford, where I'm an affiliate, and so, as along with Herman Bruberg. Ayush Kanodia is a computer scientist. Um, Emil Palakot was a postdoc with me, economics PhD, who's now joint marketing and CS at Northeastern, and David Bly, CS stats. So we have all the bases covered for this conference in this team, and it's been really fun to work with everybody and learn from one another. So focusing in on, you know, the, the, as I said, like a specific application area as an environment to learn, in empirical labor economics, there's a, a number of, of canonical questions. One question that's received you know, um, 
hundreds or thousands of, of papers is the question of the gender wage gap. And part of that literature tries to do gender um, wage decompositions. It's not quite a causal question, but it, the, actually the statistics are the same as if it was a causal question. And part of the question is how much of wage gaps can be explained by people's histories. Another type of question is what's the impact of something like a job training program on productivity conditional on education. So in each of these cases, we're trying to condition on something about people's history. And what we've done traditionally is, in, especially in the US, we have only very small data sets, like you know, 10,000 workers, where we actually see their full career history. Um, and so these small data sets have necessitated the use of small models um, with a lot of handcrafted summary statistics in order to try to answer these questions. So a natural question is whether machine learning and AI can provide better methods for these problems. But for a long time, my answer was kind of, you know, probably not on those US size data sets. They're too small. You know, you do pay something when you do data-driven model selection. If you just don't have that much data, you're going to create more noise than signal, and it may not really help. Um, and if we try to go to bigger data sets or bring in bigger data sets, we might run into challenges of data size or data availability. And also, there's been a lot of work in econometrics about the problems that come up um, with regularization-induced biases um, due to either misspecification or omitted variables. The, the model that minimizes mean squared error leaves stuff out, and that stuff might be important for drawing causal conclusions. So my question is, you know, can we do better in the world of foundation models? Let's see. So, just as I mentioned, there's a bit of a gap between the way we do things in machine learning and AI and the way we do it in economics. Um, and one of the huge advances we've seen with foundation models is that they're using these like big, passively collected, unrepresentative data sets. And a lot of us from social sciences or statistics kind of poo-poo this and say, well, oh, it's garbage in, garbage out. It's never going to do anything interesting. But then, you know, it, it turns out it does do some interesting things. And so you know, we, we want to understand why and see if we can actually make use of that. So this idea of foundation models, um, and everybody at this point kind of knows ChatGPT, it's a machine learning model trained on a large amount of complicated high dimensional data. But one thing that you don't necessarily see when you're just interacting with ChatGPT is that it also can be adapted to downstream tasks in a, in a variety of ways. And I, one way to organize the thinking about these is there's three big ideas. The first is that they are learning some structure about the world from a self-supervised model. And if you're just going to throw all the garbage data in the world into a model, it better not require a lot of model cleaning. And so these kind of un, unsupervised, self-supervised models where you just predict what comes next, they, you don't have to organize it into variable names and categorize it and clean it. You just throw it all in and, and, and it tries to learn. So that's, that's a nice advantage if you want to bring in broader sets of data. But of course, we worry about the problems it might cause. Let's see how close I have to be to make this quicker work. Um, the second big idea is embedding functions or representations. I might go back and forth between the term embedding and representation. But the idea is it's, it's a function mapping high dimensional data into low dimensional vectors or latent vectors. And you know, in econometrics, we're familiar with this kind of idea from latent factor models where you know, there might be latent product characteristics or latent um, you know, country characteristics and latent factor loadings on those things. Um, but now this low dimensional embedding, it's going to be low dimensional, but it's, it's not that low dimensional. Like it might be thousands of dimensions, um, a thousand dimensional vector or a 4,000 dimension or an 8,000 dimensional vector to represent text. And that transformation from unstructured data into a vector is a second part of the magic of the foundation models. And the third is that, oops, yeah, that was bad. Uh, come back. Okay. Um, the third is fine tuning. And again, that's not something that everyone, everyone knows about, but in, in the know, that's a, a big part of what's going on. And I'm going to do a lot of discussion today about fine tuning and crafting the fine tuning to achieve economic objectives. And the basic idea of fine tuning is that 
you take a model, and the beautiful thing about a lot of these models, they're estimated with stochastic gradient descent. You just keep reading in your data observation by observation, and you take a gradient, and you keep updating your, your parameter vector. And so as long as I understand the functional form and I understand how to take the gradients, I can just keep that training process going on a new data set and just continue as if I was OpenAI or Meta in the training and just do it on my own specialized data. And if the last few thousand observations come from my data set, then you shift those parameters um, to learn your own problem and, and they'll give good results for that. And so, you know, you might not think that would work, but it turns out that it works very well, and that's one of the things I'm going to show you today. So, the, the, then when, in this environment, now that I've defined a foundation model, what are some of the questions motivating the talk? First of all, can these foundation models improve our practice in empirical economics? And I'm going to be, as many of you from the econometric side know, we often have been using predictive models as kind of what we call nuisance parameters, or you know, they're a way to kind of soak up variation or control for confounders and causal problems. So we've sometimes decomposed a problem into a predictive problem and a causal part. And so a better predictive prediction model is going to allow us to do our downstream task better. And I'll make that more precise in a bit. So assuming just taking that as given, that better prediction models will help me accomplish my downstream tasks, the question is, well, if I, okay, can they help at all? Um, and if so, do I need to make my own special customized foundation model? And that's where I started. Um, or can we do something with an off-the-shelf model, either just directly off-the-shelf, like OpenAI's models or, or Meta's Llama models? Or do I want to do some combination where I fine-tune those? And along the way, what's the interaction between the model size and the data availability? I certainly wouldn't try to train a millions and millions of parameter models starting from scratch on a, a couple thousand observations. Um, but if I, if I pre-train them on a big corpus, can I actually make them work on a much smaller data set? How should this fine tuning be done? And so one of our proposals are, are ways to modify that fine tuning um, in support of the economic objectives, like causal inference objectives that we have in mind. Um, another thing that you know, I thought I knew back in the day was that you know, if you have an objective, you should optimize that objective and say, if I'm trying to fit like an outcome like wage, I shouldn't try to also fit other things or I'll pay a price. But actually, in this environment of learning underlying structure about the world, we're actually finding that trying to fit more things than just the thing you care about, adding additional objectives can improve your performance by helping you learn better representations, better underlying structure. Um, and so in the process of thinking about those things, we really want to figure out how to tailor these, these foundation model and fine tuning methods for our objectives. And one of the things that's going to require is econometric theory that engages with the approach and also acknowledges that these general purpose representations are imperfect. Um, so we want to engage with the, the methods where they are. And then, of course, this will open up new questions and opportunities because there, we do all, we, what we normally have done as economists is we take these very rich data sets with like, all sorts of fields and information, and then we spend months and our research assistants spend many months cleaning the data set and like making assumptions. And we write a 15-page data appendix saying how we transformed this and we dropped missing this, that. And we you know, summarize things this way and combine things that way. And it's a huge, huge lift. And the magic of these models is that actually you can just put in unclean data and save yourself the, the months and the 20-page data appendix. Um, because the models are much more flexible in terms of what you commit. Of course, if you're going to do that, then you need to be extra disciplined about showing the summary statistics and showing their performance to make sure that, that things aren't going wrong. And I think that's the piece of this evaluating part that's a, a research agenda that will take us all a long time to carry out. But again, the way, how do you carry out that research agenda? How do you show people how to use the methods? Well, you have to actually use them in applications. So jumping in now, um, I'm going to start with Career, which is a custom foundation model. And this is a paper that came out last year in Transactions and Machine Learning Research. And um, this is going to be a benchmark that I'm going to compare to in the rest of the talk. 
So in this paper, um, one of our tasks is predicting wages. And again, having a good wage prediction model is an input into causal effects of training or gender wage decompositions. If we want to predict wages, um, of course, we could start with just all of people's career histories, but there's too many histories. And so we obviously, you know, there's more histories than there are uh, people in the United States, let alone people in a, in a 12,000 person data set. And so we're never going to get anywhere if we are completely non-parametric and flexible about modeling the histories. So what do we want to do? Well, in practice in economics, we just summarize those by hand. And we spend a lot of time summarizing those histories by hand, just describing our heuristics and doing robustness checks about it. The alternative we're going to talk about here is building a custom foundation model where we learn representations of careers from a corpus of 23 million resumes. Now, this you have to either buy this data or scrape this data, so it's not generally available. Um, it's also not representative. It's just whatever people self-supported. The people who choose to post their resumes in places they can be scraped are not representative of the population, and people leave stuff off of the resumes. But these resumes um, have a lot of information about job transitions, and they can help us start to make sense of these histories. So we can think about there being like transition distribution. There's a probability of a first job, and then there's a probability of a second job conditional on the first job, and so on. And that's the distribution that we might try to estimate in our foundation model. And the insight is that getting quality representations or quality embedding function, a quality way to go from the large dimensional histories to a lower dimensional vector is the biggest challenge. And even though this resume is that data is messy, it can serve as a foundation for downstream tasks. Um, and so what we're going to do is try to, to build this model to predict transitions. One of the reasons I mentioned earlier this was a fun model to work on, and actually we worked on this before ChatGPT came out, it was to say, OK, transformers were this new cool thing. They seemed to be doing pretty well. We didn't know how well, but they were doing well already when we started the paper. And we built, and so we tried to use the transformer model in order to solve this problem of next jobs. So the idea is that a sequence of jobs, that's like a discrete choice, a sequence of discrete choice problems out of 300 words, that's not very different than a sequence of words out of you know, 27,000 commonly used English words. And so the, the structure of the sequence of jobs is very similar to the structure of text, and we could use the same kinds of techniques. So the way that, and then if we want to take this foundation model and then use it for wages, well, actually, the publicly posted resumes have no wages at all. Um, so how could this possibly help predict wages? Well, the way that that helps is that the, 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 by predicting next job transitions, we're able to understand something about the structure of those jobs and get a good representation. And if the representations or the embeddings that work for going from history to the next job, are similar to the underlying structure that's related to wage, then having this big data set that allows us to learn a good embedding function will um, allow us to also predict wage. So that's, that's the idea. And we can, but the wages are only even available on these much smaller data sets. So, um, we, we've been joking throughout this conference about the math and how the, uh, uh, the uh, computer scientists get mad that there's too much math on the economist slide and the economists get mad that there's not enough math on the computer scientist slide. So here's my math. Um, but actually, if you look at our TML, T, TMLR paper, I actually really did find this mathematics helpful. I don't know that you will in 30 seconds. But um, you know, it's like, what is this thing? What is this transformer model? Just show me the equations. Like, I want to understand what it is. So let me show you our little model very briefly. Um, and it's a custom model where we added bells and whistles beyond what the transformer is for text. One thing we just needed was covariates. And so we brought in covariates because, you know, they're not there usually for the text models. The second thing is that we have a, a, like a nested logit framework where we first model whether you switch jobs or not with a separate model, um, same underlying latent vectors as underneath things, but a diff, you know, different parameters determining whether you stay or go that depend on which job you're in now. And then conditional on moving, we model as a multinomial logit similar to the ChatGPT style models 
um, we model the probability that of what the next job is. So these are just logit models, each one at the end. Um, the, what's complicated about it is that these are models with very large dimensional latent covariates. And so that's kind of what we're estimating. This function, lambda of theta, it's a, it's a pre-specified function. We determine the functional form as a transformer neural net. Theta are the parameters we're estimating. And it's a mapping from histories of jobs and covariates to a latent vector. And so if you look at the multinomial logit equation, um, there it's got the standard form, but there's latent covariates. That function of history is the latent covariates parameterized by theta. And then there's latent coefficients on those, that latent vector, beta j, which is the loadings that are corresponding to the job j. So this is telling you what is the probability of going from your history into job j. And it's the dot product of two latent vectors. Now, if I have a wage model, then that might just be a standard linear model. Um, here, we, we use a, a shallow neural network to transform that you know, couple thousand dimensional, uh, or in this case, actually 756 dimensional latent vector um, into uh, a smaller dimension that predicts wage. And then at the bottom are the, the recursive equations for defining the, the parameters of the model. And basically, they, they use these attention weights. And the attention weights was like the, the, one of the innovations of the transformer models. They tell you, say, for period 10 in the career, how much should you pay attention to what happened in period 5 in the career or period 2 in the career. And how much period 10 pays attention to period 2 depends on what your history was. So if you're uh, you know, a, a, a store clerk or a lawyer, how much you need to pay attention to long ago might be different than if you know, you're a software engineer. And so we, you build up recursively those parameters with putting weights that tell you how much period t pays attention to period um, t prime before it. So those are my equations for the transformer model. Um, we're all, everybody's using these the same equations, and you know, we can take derivatives and get the gradients and use stochastic gradient descent to optimize these things. And, and all of the software is like available and easy to program because other people have done a lot of the work. Now, how do you, what is the fine tuning part? Um, basically, you're gonna continue the training of the foundation model using a smaller, more specialized data set. And, and crucially, that fine tuning phase could use the same objective that's the easiest way to think about it. Like OpenAI was training, 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 and then you just keep training, 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 or Meta was training, 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 taking gradients, and you just take more of the same gradients, use the same code, and just keep going just like you're them on your own data set. But another thing you can do is you can define your own custom objective and start differentiating something different and take different gradients, but just take that same parameter vector and move it along to optimize your new objective. Um, so, and you can take a couple of different approaches. What we do in this first paper is that we do the pre-training ourselves using our resume data. And so we start from scratch and look at 23 million resumes and all the transitions in those resumes and come up with a theta hat in the pre-training phase. But in the later papers, we go to Meta's model and we just start with where Meta left off and they've published online their theta hat and we just keep going where Meta left off. The second step of this is to update our parameters by continuing the stochastic gradient descent estimation of theta hat. And for the wage MSE example, we just use as our objective function the mean squared error in the smaller survey data set. And the nice thing is that even if you have hundreds or thousands of latent parameters, which correspond, latent dimensional vectors, which corresponds to millions or billions of parameters, you can fine tune very quickly in like 20 minutes or an hour um, using online services uh, to, to do your fine tuning on the size data sets that we have. So this is actually very easy to do. It might sound complicated if you've never done this before, but there's so much open source software that it's really like one of the easiest programming environments I've ever lived in. And I've seen students have the most success in this environment um, getting stuff done quickly. It's actually a much more flexible and easy environment than the old world was, which is kind of shocking. Um, okay, so then, when we compare the wage prediction models, let me look at two classes of wage prediction models. Um, one are linear models based on summary statistics. And we basically go to the state of the art from the applied economics literature 
and follow their functional forms and compare. And then we compare those to models that include history from this, um, this fine-tuned fine -tuned foundation model, where again, we're starting with these big resumes and then fine-tuning to fit wages on our survey data sets. So these are just some simple results from this. Um, we, here's a just, in this, this table we're using R squared because it's a, um, you know, it's a, a prediction, continuous prediction of wages. And we see how the R squared improves from, at the top, the standard regressions that people use in economics papers to the last row, which is what we get out of our found fine-tuned foundation model. And we get a, a, a very substantial improvement in R squared. And I'll show you in a minute how that translates into emitted variable bias in a downstream task. We also try different versions to see, well, is it just you know, the better functional form for a single occupation? Is it just about how you capture leaving the labor force? What are the different forces? And all of the, all of the factors are relevant for getting the best predictions. OK, now to see how you would use this for an economic problem, um, I want to look at the gender wage gap and, um, and see how, how we can use this type of, of technology, but also how we would modify the technology for our specific goals. So, oops. Um, so when we're trying, the, the gender wage gap, I'm not going to go into all the details about it here, but it's not, there's not a causal interpretation of the gap between men's wages and women's wages conditional on history, but we use, causal, we use the causal toolkit in order to adjust for covariates in order to decompose what part is explained by history and what part is unexplained. And that helps us give insight into wh which kinds of policies would be helpful, should it be early career policies or policies about how you bargain for wages, um, which, which, one, which one is important. So, if we just use predictive methods, we would just be trying to, to take, say, what's labeled A1 and try to make it similar to what's labeled B1. We would try to find a function of history that gives us a conditional expectation that is similar to what we could do with a very large data set if we saw if we actually conditioned on the full history. So our representation or our embedding, we're looking for basically a sufficient statistic for the full history. And just from with, with a predictive mindset, we would look for women and say, okay, I want a model that fits women's wages, and for men, I want a model that fits men's wages. But if we're trying to do gender wage gaps, we don't actually care that much about how we fit one gender separately. What we actually care about is whether we have a good model of the differences between men and women. So we're particularly interested in making sure we pick up on all covariates that might explain gaps between men and women. And so that's part of how we want to change our, our training approach to target that objective. And omitted variable bias is the problem that would happen if we left, if, if our lambda of H, our representation of the full history, omitted something, for example, through cross-validation, regularization, it left out something that was actually important for the gender wage gap. And that's why economists aren't just worried about mean squared error, goodness of fit, they want to make sure that they, they don't leave out important confounders. So in order to, to make progress on this, we operationalize this by showing that omitted variable bias of lambda, which is the bias we get from substituting in a representation of history instead of the full history, that bias can be written as a covariance of two terms. One term is the, the, the gap in prediction of, of your outcome, in this case wage, from using a low dimensional representation. And the second term is the gap in the log odds ratio for being either female or male, here the, the log for being female as a function of history from going from full history to the representation. And so this, this, what this covariance term is basically saying is if I leave something out that is both predictive of wage and predictive of gender, that's what's going to cause an omitted variable bias. If I leave something out that predicts wage but that's uncorrelated with gender, it won't screw me up from, a, from a, a gender wage gap perspective. And so in our paper, we introduced methods for fine tuning that optimize for the omitted variable bias, building on techniques from the heterogeneous treatment effect literature 
Um, we, one thing we find works well is the R learner objective pioneered by, my, by um, Stefan Wager, my colleague, and so Zian Wager. And that basically targets the, the gap between men and women in the training as the objective rather than mean squared error. We also have a result that shows that, um, that tries to kind of um, engage with this, this approach that we're using, that we are first trying to come up with a good representation, and then we're gonna use the representation to estimate these treatment effects. And we move, we have a, a variation on results that people have used in the treatment effect literature where this variation says that we only need to have the convergence that people usually look for conditional on the representation as long as this omitted variable bias term goes to zero fast enough. And then we specifically target that omitted variable bias term in our training. So now, when we do this, what kinds of benefits does this gain? Well, the standard models would just control for your occupation, and manager is an occupation, or office admin support is an occupation. But when we use the, the low dimensional vectors that we estimate, we subdivide those occupations into smaller categories, and we show, for example, the subdivision of manager shows that there are different types of managers that we identify. They're not written in the data as subcategories, but these are things that we discover from the data. And we can see these subdivisions are also things that are correlated with gender. So software developer and electrical engineer, 11% female, and that's a type of manager. But in the, in the survey data, that's just labeled as manager while someone who has a, a history as a cashier or a homemaker might also be a manager um, that's a 93% female. So these are things that, that, would, that would have omitted variable bias, and that's what, 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 were, what was being left out of the previous models. So when we go back to the gender wage gap literature, we show that, that when, when we adjust for these richer covariates, we close about a quarter of the wage gap that was previously unexplained. So that shows these omitted variables were important for the policy conclusions. All right, so now I wanna move to the last part, which is, you know, I was very excited about this model and we really love this model and it was custom created and it uses the covariates and it, has a special model for staying versus leaving, and you know I can interpret it, understand it, and then it turns out we're gonna we're gonna kind of crush it with something that's less structured, um, and so you know, but that's the way research works, um, and so part of it we're gonna show I'm gonna show you why that custom model where we did all of our own math and all of our own coding. Um, and, and, and pre-trained on resume data, which seemed like really relevant data, like a lot more relevant than whatever is posted on Reddit, um, but we somehow still uh, don't do as well as you would if, when you start from large language models as your foundation. And this was, I mean, I didn't know what we were gonna get, and I was a little disappointed at the answer, but now I'm, I've become converted, and now I'm, I'm very excited about understanding why and figuring out how to use it. So as I mentioned earlier, next word prediction and next job prediction are very similar tasks, and so we can, in principle, we can turn this structured problem where we have like a structured data set, rectangular data set with, you know, lists of jobs, we can actually just turn that into a text, which you could use to prompt a large language model. So how does that look? Well, um, what, what, actually, so, um, so what that's gonna, what that'll look like is actually just feeding in the text of a resume that we create into a large language model. And so these large language models, we're gonna find improved predictions. We show that they're gonna perform better than the state of the art, and we're going to show that the predictions based on English words is really what's driving it, that, or a big part of what's driving it. It's really the understanding of the words. We're also gonna show that it enables us to combine data sets um, in, in interesting ways. We also go do a pretty detailed analysis of how having bigger models compares to having more data for performance. We're gonna do this again on these survey data sets, um, PSID, NLSY 79, and NLSY 97. The NLSY data sets are two different cohorts of people that started their careers in that time, and the PSID kind of is, spans a larger time period, and we look at different cuts of the PSID. Partly the, the career paper used people only who start, who data after 1995, and so in order to compare to that previous paper, we sometimes subset to that sample. Um, then, uh, 
So, so how does this look? How does this work in practice? Well, we can start with our nice data set that we download from the government website, and we can write a little script that takes as input the government data with its, all of its fields and outputs a text resume. It's not exactly a resume you would post on the web, but it's our version of a text resume, or we call it a template. And so we encode the covariates in the beginning of the prompt. The following is a resume of a female white US worker residing in the Northeast region. So we just put the covariates in as text. And then we show a sequence of jobs as text. And here's an example of what a large language model might give in response to that prompt. They might, you might leave a blank after, and ask it to complete what happens after 1984 to 1985 high school diploma. And it will might fill in waiters and waitresses, and then it can fill in the rest of the resume. So you could just go to ChatGPT and do this, and I, some people around me argue that these things are magic and they've achieved super intelligence and they will be able to do this beautifully without any more data or effort. They somehow know all of the conditional moments in the universe and can spit them back out with the right probabilities. I was skeptical of that, and we will show that that is not possible, they are not magic, um, but when you fine tune them, they actually do perform quite magically. Um, so the fine-tuning step, we're going to fine-tune Llama. So we take the text template, we put it through the Llama 2 tokenizer, which is open source software that makes it understandable by the Llama model. And then we use um, unsupervised fine-tuning to optimize the next, per next token prediction on the entire set of tokens in the resume. So we teach our model to kind of understand our template and to predict our template and to understand what order things should go in, as well as to understand the conditional probabilities. And that's our fine-tuned model. So what are some advantages here? Well, um, the large-scale data set, we bought it and other people have bought it, but you know, I can't just post it on my website and use it for teaching. And so you know, what, what I'm show, gonna show you that we do now is the government websites are publicly available. Um, and you can actually, anybody can, can build these models. Anybody can download Llama and anybody can build the models. It does cost you know, maybe 50 bucks to fine tune them um, using open source stuff if, you're, if your university doesn't have enough GPUs or you don't wanna wait in line. Um, but other than that, it's relatively easy to do and you know, just takes a few minutes. Um, we can deal with, what we're gonna show is that with the pre-trained model, we can make these things work quite well with just these tens of thousands or, or thousands of observations. Um, when the, the project we did with our own custom foundation model with the 23 million resumes, we had to pay much bigger computation costs to create our own foundation model, while well, now Meta is doing it once and then releasing it for all of us, and then we don't have to repeat that computational cost. So, I have a little table here um, that kind of tries to compare and contrast traditional econometric models, deep learning models, career, and what we call this labor LLM model. And the, the, the career model, for computational reasons, we stuck with a, a 768 dimensional latent vector, while LAMA uses between 4,000 and 8,000. We used, that resulted in millions of latent parameters in the career model, while we're gonna have either 7 billion, 13 billion, or 70 billion in the LAMA models. And again, you might think, wow, 70 billion, like how could I fine tune that? But, and how could it possibly work? But on a few thousand observations, but it, miraculously it kind of does. Um, and so then in, relative to these other models, we're actually going to produce text as the output of our model. But then when we evaluate the text, we're gonna translate it back into jobs. And, and you lose points if you don't predict a real job. If you, if you hallucinate a job that's not a job, then your model will not score as well in predictive performance or if you don't match the template. Um, then, uh, so we're gonna look at three different approaches the, that are like sub-approaches of this large language model, foundation model approach. The first is that we create, we take a foundation model or maybe a fine-tuned version of it, and we take that embedding function and apply it to histories. Then we treat the covariates that come out of that I mean, or the, 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 the features that come out of that is as, as if they were observed covariates, and then we just train a regular old classifier for which job you have next. So it's basically using these foundation models to create covariates, either 4,000 dimension covariates or 8,000 dimensional covariates. 
The second thing we can do is we're actually going to use the model to directly predict text, and we can do that without fine-tuning NFT or with fine-tuning and not an NFT token, um, but not fine-tuning NFT for fine-tuning. Um, then uh, if we, then, so one of the advantages of the embedding is that we're gonna, it's gonna be a discrete choice problem, and so you might think you get a really big leg up by telling it, here are your 300 occupational choices, and you have to choose from that set rather than allowing you to, to predict anything in the English language where you might guess outside the set. So this is one advantage. Um, so we have three different versions of these embeddings, one where we get the embeddings with fine-tuned large language models, one where we just get the embeddings from off-the-shelf large language models. It turns out the second one doesn't work very well, so to try to give it a little more of a leg up, we include in our prompt of the off-the-shelf large language model the list of possible jobs. And what we're gonna see is that that's gonna work um, the best. So here I'm gonna use perplexity as the outcome, and perplexity is basically saying my model is just as good as narrowing things down to 14 jobs or 13 jobs and then choosing at random. So that's the interpretation of the magnitudes here. And what we see is that the, the using the embeddings from the, a fine-tuned 13 billion parameter model um, for into the classifier does as well as the, the state-of-the-art career model, which itself was much better than the econometric regressions. So, and we didn't, this approach could be taken further, so this approach we might be able to make it work better than we did. The next one is we're gonna predict jobs as text. So literally the model is just gonna output text. And we can start again with, with a non-fine-tuned off-the-shelf LLM, it could be OpenAI or it could be Llama. We're gonna predict a job, and when we evaluate it, we'll evaluate the entire set of words as a job, so that we're comparing apples to apples across the different models. Um, and so there's two problems with the off-the-shelf. One is that, you know, Llama and OpenAI aren't magic. They don't know all the conditional probabilities in the world. And second, they can hallucinate jobs. Um, what we find in our results is that um, these things do terribly. So no fine tuning, the perplexity is like, you know, more than 10 times worse, and this is just not a good approach. So those of you who thought that these, these, uh, these models were magic and had somehow learned the entire world and the structure of the world, they haven't learned this problem yet. But if you fine tune them using data where you actually could estimate conditional probabilities, it turns out they do work very well. And so these are um, showing, this is the fine-tuned um, 70 billion llama model versus career, and the, this is bootstrapping to show all the different data points, and we find substantial improvement, systematic improvement across all the data sets and across subpopulations and everything else of our llama-based models over the existing models. And it comes out, like in PSID, it comes out to about um, 0.76 perplexity points. Let me skip this. So the last thing I want to show you is the, um, the uh, impact of model size versus data for, Im for, um, for improving the models. So what we do here is we start with three different data sets. Um, in this case, it's a larger PSID data set with 19,000 people, 5.1 million tokens. Um, and then what we do is we add more data from the other two data sets. So for each data set, we add data from the other data sets and see how things get better. And we see that um, relative to the um, 13 billion parameter model, adding just 30% more data from the other two data sets, so it's the wrong years, it's not exactly the same data source, but the long calendar years in particular, gets you back to beating the 13 billion parameter model. So having more fine-tuning data, even if it's non-representative, can substitute for having more parameters. Then what we do is we um, do a different comparison. We want to try to see if we can like, add more and more data. So we, we start, first of all, we look and see what happens if you mismatch data sources, and we find that it does really matter to use the right data source. But then we try to see if we keep adding more and more data um, from incorporating all of the different uh, data sources and using a, a um, and, and continuing to fine tune with the entire mix, 
we find that we can actually beat the 70 billion parameter model with the 7 billion model. So we find that a simpler, smaller model can work better with more fine tuning data. And this is something we're gonna continue to explore. So um, I'm just about out of time, so I'll just, uh, I'll just very quickly mention that we also try taking away the text from the jobs just to see if it's just having a really rich model with lots of parameters, and we find that taking the text away and just replacing it with numbers doesn't work well. So summarizing um, these foundation model approaches, I was kind of sad. I kind of liked my hand-constructed models where I could feel like a superior economist, but um, I was beaten by the LLMs. Um, but at least giving us some reason to, to continue to exist as a profession. Um, we did find that we also can, can get some traction by keeping track of what is the task we want to do and, and improving our fine tuning methods for those tasks. And so in the future, I wanna sort of combine these two threads and put together the large language foundation models and the custom tailored fine tuning methods that take account of causal inference theory um, and see where we can go with it. Thank you. Thanks for a great talk. Um, can this framework be useful in doing counterfactual policy analysis, like for like job, job transitions, such as like equal opportunity policies? Yeah, so I mean, once you have these good predictive models, as long as you could plug them into something like an R learner to get heterogeneous treatment effects, um, so you can think, a lot of the, the methods for optimal policy learning and heterogeneous treatment effects use a predictive model as a, um, as a nuisance function, basically. But also you could fine tune directly for heterogeneous treatment effects and get direct estimates using an, a modified objective. So I haven't, we've, we've done some of that with the gender wage gap, but there's that, you know, this is where you would go next, I think, with this work. Thank Thanks. you.